Welcome to USA Kids Today, Next Generation. I'm Melissa Oshfett and I love slime. Today we're going to be making jiggly slime. Let's get to it. So, we're going to be using regular white school glue. You want to use about a cup. <laughs> So, it's on the floor. There's my glue. So, now we're going to add water. It can be warm, cold, doesn't matter. You probably want to add about half a cup. <coughs> Make sure you get that evenly mixed. I want to add a little bit more. Kind of want it to be thin. So now this part is optional, but you can add color. You can use paint, but I'd recommend using food coloring because paint kind of clumps up in my experience after a while. So I'm going to add your coloring. You want to be careful because you don't want to put too much in there because it does get on your hands. So you want to mix that up. Then you can add glitter if you want to. I'm going to make this yellowish greenish color. I love it when it like mixes together because it looks so cool. I'm going to thoroughly mix this in. this lime greenish color. Now I'm going to add some light pink sparkles. There we go. You also want to be careful with sparkles because they come off in your hands too and sparkles are hard to get rid of so if you get them on your hands and like you try to wash it then you use a towel it just gets all over so now that that's done we're going to use our activator today i'm going to be using borax for me my borax solution is half a teaspoon to a cup of warm water you can use stronger than that like a whole teaspoon but since this is chemicals i'd like i like to kind of, like I don't want my solution to be too strong, so it might take you a little bit longer to get it all mixed up since the solution's a little bit weaker. You can also use saline solution or contact lens solution, or you can use detergent, but to me, whenever I use detergent, it doesn't work very well. But you can find all of this stuff at a local store normally. So you just want to add this in slowly. When you're adding your activator, you don't want to add too much. 
but you want to make sure that if you have like warm hands, you don't want your slime too sticky, but if you have like cold hands, then you're not going to want it too hard because you warm hands melt it, cold hands kind of harden it. Just want to keep adding your activator until you get that texture that you like. It's fun to give your slimes like personalities, like give them some cool names. I think I would name this one, eh, I think I'd name it Key Lime Pie. And it's also cool because when you put it in like your container or your baggie and you label it, you'll be like, oh, I remember that slime. So when you dispose of it, because you know sometimes slime just gets old, you don't want to throw it in the sink or throw it outside because it'll clog the drain or somebody could step in it. The best way to do is just throw it in a little plastic Ziploc baggie or something and just put it in your garbage can. But when you do put it for storage, I like to use containers because you can just easily take the container and play with it while it's in there. Plus it's super easy to get out. But if you have it in a plastic bag, it's kind of hard to get out. Plus you can't really like play with it in the container because like if you try to squeeze it or something in the bag, it'll kind of pop out a little bit. So right about now, I'm gonna go with my hand. You never wanna go in with two hands when it's still this sticky because you wanna have one hand free for that activator. So get all of that off of there. As you can tell, it's starting to form a little bit. You always want to have a towel or some paper towels next to you. If you're not allowed to use a regular towel because your parents are like, I don't want you to mess up my towel, you can ask them if there's like an old one that's maybe stained or is ripped or something that they wouldn't care if you messed up and just have a designated towel. Or you can even use paper towels. I wouldn't recommend using toilet paper because it's super thin so it kind of rips apart easy. a little too sticky for me. Now, whenever you use your activator, you really want to make sure, especially with your borax, that it's fully mixed up because if it isn't and it's kind of like chunky, it can give it like an egg-like texture, kind of, so. You can also add some lotion if it's not that stretchy. Like if you overactivate it, you can add lotion. Uh -oh. This is a pretty good slime. So here is my key lime pie slime. This is Alyssa Osterfeld. Don't get too sticky. Next up, a USA Kids Today blast from the past. We're going back in time with the original USA Kids Today cast.
Welcome to another show of You Say Kids Today. I'm Holly Harker and these are my friends who are helping me host today's show. As you can see, we've got a really wild show planned for you today. Well, first let me introduce everyone. This is Laura Martin. Hi. This is Alyssa Ryan. Hi. This is Laura DeVita. Hi. And this is Stephanie DeVita. Hi. And we have a special guest host on today's show, Miss Marsha Bonhart from Channel 2 News. Hello. Thanks for having me here today. No. It's my pleasure. Today we'll be learning about all kinds of exotic pets with Mr. Jeff Embleson from the Super Pet Store. So please welcome Mr. Jeff Embleson to the show. Okay. Thanks for having me. And also on today's show, we have a kid power report, a calendar report, and a have you met my pet report done by some of the USA Kids Today reporters. Some of the USA Kids Today reporters are here visiting us on the set today. They've all been busy searching and covering interesting stories for our show. Miss Marsha Bonhart is a news reporter from Channel 2. Miss Bonhart, are you going to share with us some... Um, some secrets of your success and give us some tips? Sure, Holly. I uh, tell you, I, I'm not so sure that I'm successful because every day I just try to strive harder, as I hope all of you young ladies do and members of our audience as well. I think uh, what success means, but thank you for saying that I'm successful, but I think what success means is that you do your best every day and you try hard every, every day. You know, you don't... Um, just sit back and think, oh, well, I'm successful, so I can just stop trying to do a good job. And, you know, I just kind of bum around and do nothing. I think success means when you just, every day you go in there, you give it your best shot. You know what I mean? If you try to do that in school, you know, those kinds of things. If you may, maybe one day you didn't have a real good day in school, and you think, oh, I'm just terrible. I can't do this anymore. I'm not smart. Well, you know, everybody has a bad day. I have a bad day on the news all the time. But I know that the next time I get on the news, I'm going to give it my best shot. No matter what happens, I'm going to do what? What did I just talk about? Um, trying your hardest. That's right. Trying your hardest and, and, and doing your best. And that, I think that's the, probably the biggest tip I can give you guys, unless you had some other questions for me. Um, before the show, do you ever get pre-staged jitters? Look at my hands. What do you see? Sweat. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of it, too, huh? Yeah. Sure, every time the lights come on, every time I hook on that microphone, the same microphone that you all have on, every time, I, I sure I get nervous. It's because, much of it is because I'm excited about what's to come. Because in television, you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, you know, like right now, we have everything just so set and planned and, and just cut to the T. But in this business, you just never know. Equipment could break down at the last minute. You have to be ready for anything. You, you know, sometimes we have a teleprompter and, and that ha will have your script on it, but sometimes the teleprompter might break or the person who's running the teleprompter might be drifting off someplace. So you're just always keyed up and you always have to be ready. You always have to be prepared. And it's in the, for those of you who are Girl Scouts or have been Girl Scouts, you know, that's your, your great motto, be prepared. Well, that is also the motto of life. You know, you just have to be prepared at all times for everything. So yeah, I get nervous and I, my hands perspire and all that good stuff, but it just kind of gets me psyched up a little bit, you know? How'd you get started as a news reporter? Well, it was an interesting situation. Ever since I was much younger than, than you ladies, I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I really didn't want to do television as much as I wanted to work for a magazine. I wanted to work for back, back when I was a little girl, Life magazine was a major magazine and it kind of died out and now it has come back. But when I was little I wanted to write for Life magazine. But by the time I got to high school, my high school journalism teacher had another opinion. He decided he should push me towards the broadcast end of journalism. So I kind of reluctantly went into the broadcast end when I went to college. But I didn't really want to, but I'm glad that he kind of, sometimes you need a little nudge from people. They, you, sometimes you don't always know what could be better for you. And so he thought that he knew what was better for me. And uh, actually, he was right. It turned out okay. Do any of your stories affect um, you in your real life? Yes. Many of my stories affect, affect me in my real life. I have two children. So anytime that there is a story about children, I become extremely affected, particularly um, if it is a story that is a negative story. And I sometimes have a hard time dealing with some of the things that happen to children, particularly lately. It's, it's difficult for me as a mother, as a human being, 
first of all, and as a mother, I think I kind of take some of those stories extra personally. What are some of the strangest stories you've ever covered? Well, I've had some pretty sad ones in my day, unfortunately. Um, and so that we don't uh, cast a shadow over this broadcast, I will skip over those. I've, I have run into some pretty funny situations, like with animals and, and things like that. And we have birds today, so there's no telling what might happen. I think one of my, my funniest shows probably is when we had uh, penguins on the set one day. And, you know, they sort of have their own personality. And uh, they can be pretty funny little fellows and, and ladies, too. I, I, I sort of like them. But uh, they, they kind of do what they want to do, and it's, it's, it's hard to corral them and uh, keep their attention, so to speak. Um, have you ever gotten really scared in, while you were in doing the show? Doing a show or doing a new show? Yeah, during the show. Well, not frightened. Uh, sometimes when things uh, sort of fall apart, uh, as I said, equipment failures or lack of communication. You know, we're in the communication business, but sometimes that communication falls down, breaks down. And uh, oftentimes when, when that happens, the whole show can just kind of crash on you. And, and the only thing that you have in front of you, thank goodness, is your script. That can save you often. So you always have to come out there, as I said earlier, and be prepared, have your script out there, know your material, know what you're going to talk about. And when you know your subject matter, and sometimes you just have to roll right off the top of your head and just start talking, just like I'm doing now, just start talking. <laughs> what, what do you like best about newscasting? Well, I like the reporting aspect because I get to meet people. Just like today, I met all of you ladies today, didn't know you before, met Jeff, met some of the folks out in the, in the studio, some of the, the crew members. And uh, that is what is most enchanting about this business to me. I do something different every day. I do some of the some of the same things every day, but I also do something different every day. And I meet different people. Some of them are pretty pretty different. <laughs> I have to say, but uh, that intrigues me. I, I, I like people who have different uh, different sides and aspects to their personality. I, I find that uh, interesting. And you have to understand this business, you meet them all. You meet all kinds of people and see all kinds of things, that's for sure. Some good, some bad. We hope you had a lot of fun over the holidays. We did. If you went to any of the Kid Islander events we told you about, you might have seen us around. We did a little bit of reporting on Holiday Fest 95 and things the kids in the Miami Valley did over the holidays. We're going to take a look at that video, and when we come back, have a paper and pencil ready because we're going to give you the list of Kid Islander events. Hello, I'm Courtney Cunningham and we are downtown at Courthouse Square where Holiday Fest 95 is beginning. We are in front of the registration booth for the Holiday Hunt. As you can see, there's a lot of activity going on around here. A lot of kids here today. The Junior League really enjoys um, working on events for children. We sell about a thousand tickets. We have a thousand tickets available to sell, so hopefully we'll have a sellout. How can you participate in the hunt? You need to buy a ticket. The Junior League is selling tickets for five dollars, and um, you can buy the tickets right over here. We give you a map of all the locations okay. that are on the hunt, and we give you a shopping bag to put all your fun things in. What exactly is the holiday hunt like? What do you do? Well, it's similar to a scavenger hunt. Each stop you go to will give you um, a little prize, like a notepad or a cookie, balloons, pencils, things kids enjoy. It's the box where you put your ticket in when you're done doing the hunt. If you find to ten or more stops, you're eligible for um, our special raffle prize. And we have about 20 different raffle prizes in that, including bicycles and theater tickets. Um, yeah, bike helmets. Okay. This clown is part of the entertainment at the Holiday Fest. Wait, me, I, my name is Sneezy. That's what it says right here. You have to look out because when I sneeze, terrible things happen, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you like doing this? I'd like to do this a lot. Do you? I haven't had much experience. Oh, okay. <laughs> what exactly do you do? Well, I'm making balloon animals right now. Have you ever done the hunt before? Yes. Is it fun? Yes. Very hard? No. 
Kids Hello, my name is Courtney Cunningham, and I'm from USA Kids Today. What's your name? Erin. Where are you from? Chicago. And you came all the way here to do the holiday hunt? No, I, I'm staying over with my um, aunt and uncle. Oh, okay. Um, has the holiday hunt been fun so far? Yeah. Have you got a lot of stuff in your bag? Yeah. Okay, wait for the whole group. Take your gloves out. Stuff in your bag? Pull some stuff out, sure. What you got? <laughs> Kaleidoscope, what else? I got a pen of paper. My name is Courtney Cunningham and I'm from USA Kids Today. What's your name? Forrest. How old are you? Five. Have you ever done the holiday hunt before? Um, no. <laughs> is it fun? Yeah. That would be fun. What's in your bag? It's great to be down here and fun. We're having a great time here downtown Dayton, and we're gonna have that big tree lighting up about eight o'clock. So we're gonna have a great time down here and have lots of fun with all the kids, right? Is right. right? Oh, she's zooming in on my nose, isn't she? <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> this has been Courtney Cunningham reporting for USA Kids Today from the Holiday Fest '95 downtown Dayton. Over to you now, Laura. Traditional things from Germany. We have some ornaments that would be used in Germany, and we have some angel items and some Advent wreaths. Then we have some prayer books in German and other things that German children would appreciate. Plus, we have lots of homemade apple strudel down there, which is traditional for the holidays. What are you wearing? This is a traditional costume for women in Germany. This is called a dirndl, and you always wear an apron with the dirndl, and the bow tells whether you're married or not. You tie it in the front, you're married, and if you tie it in the back, it means you're single. So, I'm married, and this is where you keep the coins that you need. 
do you say happy holiday in Germany? I like Wienachten. How do you feel about being popular around the world? Well, actually, uh, the person I represent is St. Nicholas. Santa Claus is an extension of a religious figure from about uh, 350 A.D. in Turkey. And he's changed from country to country, but basically is now Santa Claus. What are you wearing here? Well, I'm wearing a bishop's robes, uh, chasuble, that's what this is, and a cassock, which is the red, and a surplus, which is the white garment, and a mitre, which is the headgear. I come from Turkey, Asia Minor. Uh, the uh, St. Nicholas is a uh, saint of the, in the Catholic Church that was uh, a doer of good deeds for children and families. And that's where the uh, tradition of putting your shoes outside in Germany for cakes and cookies. He would take care of poor families. They would leave their shoes outside. This bishop would travel through town, through town and he would put coins in them so that they could eat and survive. That's a really nice, that's a really nice guy that did that stuff. Well, that's that. where the idea of Santa Claus comes from, the nice man. And Santa Claus fits all religions and all cultures. Is he a saint? Uh, saint Nicholas is, is considered a saint, yes.
We're just wrapping them up to give to little kids at, um, at, that are at the hospital, children's hospital. We went caroling and um, some people paid us to carol at their house and they brought and they gave us some money while we were caroling and I thought it was really thoughtful of the, the kids to um, thinking of other kids who are in the hospital right now and has to be at the hospital to, for Christmas. Reporting live for Kid Power. I'm with Troop 1065 and we're doing a community service project. Um, we're bringing in like lots of toys and games and things to do for the kids who are going to the battered women's shelter so um, they won't get bored because they can only pack a few things like what they really need like their clothes and stuff. It was pretty fun scrummaging around the house looking for toys and um, we're doing this because there are kids at the battered women's shelter and um, they're there because their house because their house isn't safe for them to live in anymore. Well, because I it makes me really feel good and I'm sure that it'll make the other kids happy. This, what we're doing now is really nice for the kids. How does it make you feel doing collecting all these toys for the battered women's shelter? Well, it makes them it makes me feel like I'm like doing something in my heart that Jesus would really like. The ch children are the mothers take the children to um, a women's shelter and they can't bring all their toys, so we brought in toys so they can um, play and not be bored. Thank you. Can make, make a, a difference. difference. Kids are really smart. Yeah. Kids are really neat ideas, and kids can do a lot. Yeah. I'm Sarah Walling, and this is Troop 1065. I'm Matthew Pascal at St. Peter's School, and I'm here with the with the student council, and I'm reporting on their food drive. I think that this food drive is important. Well, because there's a lot of people out there that don't have a house or any money to buy food with, and then if we have extra food, it should we should take it upon ourselves to give up what we have for them. Okay. Um. How did the student council come up with the idea for a food drive? Um. I think Mrs. Poling got a letter from Catholic Services to find out different things that we could do, and one of them was to donate canned foods, and it's just a nice way. Where is this food going, and who's going to transport it to where it's going? Um, some of the food is going to Holiday Aid, and the rest of it's going to Catholic Services, and I think that a truck might come from Catholic Services to pick it up. Or okay, and, and do you think that this was a good learning experience for the kids here at St. Peter's? Um, yeah, because it gives them kind of an opportunity to figure out what they have to do, like, in the world to help other people and giving food. Uh, 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 what future projects uh, do you think you're going to do? Uh, we're, right now we're planning to go to a nursing home. We're going to bring Christmas stuff and decorate it, give them cards, sing a couple of Christmas carols to get them in a Christmas spirit. Good. I'm here with Jonathan Chapman of seventh grade who brought, brought in uh, two bags of grocery bags. Uh, I think that helping um, the poor people is a good thing for the community to do. Okay. So I just wanted to be involved. Okay. At St. Peter's School, about eight, 800 students participated in a food drive. I hope you have that pencil and paper ready because it's time for the kid Alan. 
29th from 6 to 11 p.m. at Wright State University is Kids Night Out. Kids can enjoy the evening doing lots of fun things. There will be basketball, ping pong, village, racquetball, dodgeball, swimming, water polo, movies, and a video arcade. Races, games, and prizes are all part of the fun. For more information, call 873-2771 or 873-3667. The Vandalia Park and Recreation is sponsoring a Daddy-Daughter Sweetheart Social Saturday, February 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. An evening of dancing, games, arts and crafts, and refreshments is planned. For reservations and more info, call 989-8-9-8-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-
parrots can live you know, 75, 80, even 100 years. Your macaws are long lived. Well, um, it's time for Have You Met My Pet? Our report has a special message in it, so stay tuned, and when we return, we'll meet some more super pets. Hi, I'm Molly Harker, and this is... I'm Jesse Forncho. And we're here at Jesse's house. Jesse, why don't you tell us how long you've been living here and show us some of your pets that you've seen. I've lived here for about nine years, and um, we've had quite a few animals actually live here. You've had a lot of animals, about seven cats and six, six dogs. Yeah. So how do these animals come to live with you? Um, many of them were dumped off and um, just left here, and we found them. Um, in the bushes or something like that, and um, some of them we did buy. Um, some of the animals were um, sick, not fed, um, very tired, and like like that. Um, it's very. It makes me sad and mad to find these animals and in, in the conditions that they were. And you have to take a lot of your animals to the vet and get them fixed. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> we have one dog now, his name is Toby, and um, s whoever had him before kicked him, and he is now blind and in his one eye. Um, he, he can't see out of it at all, so he is blind in one eye. Um, Jasper, the puppy that we have now, um, we found him um, up at the end of the road, literally in the trash can. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that was kind of cute, but it was sort of sad that he was in there. Um, but I guess some people don't think that they can take the responsibility of having a pet. So you bought Kaiser, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why did you take J Jasper and Toby in if you already had a dog? Well, Toby, we wanted to take him in because he was blind in one eye. And uh, we wanted to take care of him so that he wouldn't get sick. And we didn't think that he could live on his own. Um, and we got Jasper because um, we, we were looking for a dog about the time that Jasper came. And um, so, and a small dog so he could come in the house. And um, so it sort of all worked out because then Jasper came and now we can put it, let him in the house and everything. So. We've got some house dogs and some house dogs and some inside dogs. I mean, house dogs, outside dogs, and inside dogs, yeah. Um, Jasper is an inside dog, and Toby and Kaiser are both outside dogs, and the cats are indoor and outdoor. So they're kind of mixture. They like to go inside and outside. What happened with Randy is, um, uh, he one day um, that we found him, and he was just wandering around, and then we kept, and he stayed for a week, and then a week later, he left. And then a week later than that, he came back with a pregnant dog, Maggie. And so she had her puppies, and um, we, we kept her. We found good homes for um, her puppies. And then we uh, spayed her. We got her spayed. Um, that's what, that was the whole problem. Is she wasn't uh, spayed. She didn't. Um, Whoever had her didn't really take care of her in that sense. Um, so we took care of her, and we kept her, and we found good homes for her puppies. And then that's about it. And then we found Jasper in, um, it let her, liter literally in the trash can. So that, that's where we got Jasper. And, um, and oh, another thing about Jazz, um, he was flea infested. Um, he had fleas from one end of him to the other. He was just, he, he had fleas all over him. It was, it was horrible. So we gave him a bunch of baths. Um, he needed it, but whoever had him did not take care of him. And then when they dumped him off, then we found him. So we, then we took care of him. When we found the dogs, we looked in the newspaper. We tried to find, um, 
people who uh, were who put an ad in there for a missing dog, and we never did find any um, for any of the dogs that we've had. So um, we don't really know what happened if they purposely did it or if they did it and then didn't put a missing ad or what. But we did look just in case. So. After talking with Jesse, I wondered how many other animals are out there that need to be rescued. So I went to the Montgomery County Animal Shelter to find out more. At the animal shelter, I met the director, Stephanie Smith. I told her my story about Jesse and how she saved all those dogs and cats. While we were there, we had a tour of the animal shelter. Um, you heard the story about Jesse, right? Right. Um, is this, is this, does this usually happen? You know, it happens more than we like to think about. Um, the good news for, for those pets is that they found somebody who could take care of them. But oftentimes what happens, people who live in the cities or people who live in the suburbs, they have this weird idea that people out in the country need their dogs and cats. So if they have a dog or cat that they feel they can't keep anymore, they'll drive out in the country, open the door, and toss the animal out, and either assume that someone who lives out there is going to take it in, or assume that the animal could live on its own, and neither of those things happen very often. So it happens more than we like to think about it happening. But those animals were lucky animals that found that home, but not everybody's going to be able to do that. How many animals usually come to the um, animal shelter about a year, every year? We pick up a little over probably six or 7,000 a year that are loose on the streets. And then there's another probably 1,000 to 1,500 that the owners will actually bring into the shelter and turn them into us because they can't keep them anymore. And that's what we want people to do. We don't want people to take them out in the country and dump them. So, how did you get Buddy? Well, Buddy, come here, Bud. Come here. Come on over here. Come, here. come on, Hold Buddy. Him up there. Up there. Buddy. Get him up there. <laughs> Buddy's one of the dogs that came in off the street. He was running loose in a neighborhood, and someone called us because they didn't recognize him. They didn't know whose dog he was. And we came and got him, and we kept him. He wasn't wearing a license. So, we held him at the shelter for three days, which the law requires, and after his owner did not come and get him, we were able to, he was then belonged to the county, and we decided that he should live here at the shelter with us. And Buddy lives here all the time, and goes to schools with us, and is in parades, and is basically greets people. He's sort of our resident dog greeter. He's a good old boy, isn't he? Yeah. He is. And see now, see what he's got now? Now he's got his license and his rabies tag, and if he would ever, ever get lost, we'd be able to get him back home. People can find him that way. See, the problem is, watch this. Buddy, where do you live? Where do you live? See, he can't answer me, can he? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. That's why these tags are so important, because we can trace that tag number and find out who he belongs to. Of course, we'd find out he belongs to us. And it, how many animals that usually don't get rescued? Well, I don't have a real good way of counting that, other than the fact that the animals who get run over on the street end up here, and we get over 3,000 dead animals brought in a year. So that, that might be a pretty good number out there. And I don't know how many others are out sending for themselves, and who now when it's real cold outside, probably don't have a warm place to go or good food to eat. But if you need to get rid of your pet, it's much better to bring it here than to just let it loose on its own. Horrible things can happen to them. They can get run over, they can get poisoned. Some people don't like animals in their yard. They'll shoot them. We've heard some sad stories. So we always tell people before you get a pet, think real seriously whether you have the time and the money to take care of it because you want to keep your pet for a long time where you don't have to make that decision as to what will happen. But things will happen occasionally in families, but then you make a responsible decision. I think he likes you. What do you think? Yeah. Huh? 
Like, it's hard to believe somebody, you know, gave him up, isn't it? Can, what can kids do to help? What can kids do to help all the animals? So much. First thing kids can do is make sure that their own pets have collars and ID tags on and licenses, okay? And if they don't, remind your, the parents that that's real, real important. The other thing that kids can do is, to, is talk about dogs and cats not having any more puppies or kittens because there's too many in the world already. And the other thing that kids can do is treat all the animals that they come in contact with with respect and kindness. And that means that you don't, you don't tease them or chase them. And if a stray animal comes into to your yard, that you go and tell an adult. Because it's not a real good idea for kids to go up to stray animals. Because some of them might bite. But always let an adult know and help out that way. I think example is a good way. I think if, if children will set an example, maybe parents will follow. If the kids talk about licenses and being a responsible pet owner, and kids need to, if they have a pet, their own pet, that they promised their mom and dad they'd take care of day after day, that they should start taking care of it day after day. This puppy was one of the lucky ones. He was found by an animal control officer on the street. Now he's being kept here with food and water and a warm place to sleep. Taking care of your pet, what a message, not neglecting them. There's so many ways that you can abuse an animal. Sometimes there's the direct abuse, that means the hitting and, and actual torture of an, of an animal. And then there's the indirect abuse, and that is when you don't give them enough food or you don't give them enough attention. Animals, your pet needs love too. So you have to keep all those things in mind when you talk about getting a pet. We're going to open up this discussion and talk to Stephanie a little bit. Do you have a, a, a cat or a dog? I have a dog mm -hmm. named Cookie. Named Cookie. She's um, she's a Labrador, and she's brown, and and we had we brought her from a family that lived up in Springfield. They were breeding dogs, and she was the last one, the last one left. And they said that some pe two people looked at her, and they said one person didn't like her because she has this white spot on her stomach. Mm -hmm for a show dog and the other person didn't like her because she didn't have yellow eyes for a show dog and we took her in it and she is our dog now and we have a dog at home. Yeah, because you didn't care about the yellow eyes or the white spot on her chest or anything like that. You just wanted a dog to, to make happy and a dog to make you happy, right? Yeah. And it's probably best that if, if folks didn't, you know, the people who looked at her did not really want her because sometimes you know, some of those animals who end up abused in the shelters because people just didn't want them anymore. But if you don't, what, what did you see, see in, the, uh, in the video? That the message was, if you don't want your pet anymore, what? Well, then you should take them to an animal shelter or some place where somebody could take care of them. And you should always take care of them and love your pets and animals. You know, because they can't take care of themselves. And so someone has to do it. It's really sad when you see a lot of them who are, are stray in the streets and are just running around and, and have no one to take care of them. And they're obviously suffering from malnutrition and some of them have broken bones, maybe a, a limp in, in, in their leg or something like that. And that makes me very sad. Animals should be respected like people should. That's right. What kinds of things do you do for Cookie? Well, I give her her food and water every day. I play with her sometimes, but not lately since it's been snowy. Mm -hmm. But if she comes inside, and she'll, she likes to get her tummy rubbed and it's a little tub of rubber tummy. Mm -hmm. she, she's just cute. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Right now we have some exotic animals, some really different kinds of pets that we're going to talk to Jeff from Super Pets about, right? Yep. This is a chinchilla. I'm from Himalaya Mountains. So, so. They're awfully small. I don't. I think we've all heard of chinchillas, but I, I didn't uh, didn't know they were that tiny. I guess I, I thought it was a much larger animal. No, we'll get a little bigger, but not much larger than this. Do most people keep chinchillas as, as pets? I don't see them running around much. That's for uh, sure. You probably won't see as many as you, uh, of chinchillas as you will rabbits, but. A lot of people keep it. <laughs> it is in the rabbit family. It's a type of rodent, yeah. Okay. Let's head up and get another look at it. How about you ladies? Have you ever seen a chinchilla? 
No. no. I have. I've seen one of the, one of my teacher had like a I little see, one, had one. like a small one, was, and it is called um, Label. Jeff, does this one have a name? Uh, we're calling him Willie. Okay. Willie Willy Chinchilli. Willie Chinchilli. <laughs> okay. Can I hold it? Um, Laura over there, Laura Martin. Uh huh. She just got her little chinchilla named Chili. Oh. So you have a chinchilla by the name of Chili, huh, Laura? Mm hmm. Okay. It's a baby. And we have another exotic pet here. Yeah, this, hedgehog. Is, this is an African hedgehog, and you can see he's kind of shy. Uh, when he gets scared like that, he balls up into just a big uh, ball of, of spines. But when he lays him down, you can pet him. Um, it's a, a domestic animal. They've been domesticated uh, three years, but uh, um, he's cute. And that is what you call a pygmy African, African hedgehog. pygmy hedgehog. Right. What is right. the difference with this? When you say pygmy, obviously it's smaller than others. Right. There are. There is a, a, another uh, type of hedgehog which is is quite larger. That's the one we know, Sonic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sonic the hedgehog. Right. This one, I, I touched. I touched his uh, his hair or his fur, uh -huh. whichever. And it, it felt as if you had moose in it. It's a little stiff, almost almost like a porcupine. Right. The quills are very sharp and hard. And uh, if an animal was to, to bite down or, or, or clamp onto this, uh, it could break off and, and cause a, a irritation. So uh, they need to be handled with care, and you shouldn't just pick them up and toss them around, that's for sure. So I guess their, their fur is a form of defense against the enemy, right. so to speak. Yes. Yes, it is. They can ball up and actually hide their whole face. Uh, and just and blend in with the environment, and you might not even know they're there. That's right. They're good little pets, though. They're great. Now, we're looking at something. We just saw a shot of uh, something on someone's shoulder. What was that? Ah, yes. What do we have there? I don't know if you can uh, yes. see this. This is an Australian bearded dragon um, from Australia, a desert animal. Uh, they're... Uh, you can't take them out of Australia anymore. You used to be a, allowed to, mm -hmm. but now they're uh, domestically raised in captivity, and they're um, they're starting to gain a lot of popularity because they're so docile. They're great. Uh, they're great little lizards. Anyone can pick this guy up and hold him. So he eats he eats uh, vegetables and crickets and. Uh, all kinds of little things. So. Really harmless. I mean, he was just resting very comfortably right. on her shoulder. No right. problem. Do you want to hold him? He looks, uh, <laughs> doesn't look docile. Oh, he doesn't, and, and he, but he is. You can see the support his back legs there. You can see he, uh, I mean, he'll sit on my shoulder as long as long as I have him out here. So he's very content. Uh, they're great little lizards. I'll put him away. Now, are these um, pets difficult to, to maintain? I mean, if some of the kids wanted to, to get one, such as the pygmy hedgehog and this lizard here? Well, just like any pet, they require, uh, they require some uh, um, special needs. But uh, uh, if you set the animal upright, no, they're not hard to maintain. They're relatively easy. So. Uh, and, and the best way, to, the best way uh, for an individual to get a pet is to uh, check out a book and actually educate yourself before you buy the pet. So that's one, one thing we try to do at Super Pets is educate children especially in handling and, uh, and dealing with a pet on an everyday basis. So. You know, so often the, the risk that you take with children and pets, especially exotic, more, more so I think with the exotic animals as right. opposed to cats and, and dogs, mm -hmm. is that uh, the novelty wears off so, so easily. You know, they yes. see something, it's like, oh, that's really weird, that's really neat, I think I want that. They get it home, and a couple of months later, it's like, <laughs> the right. thrill is gone. A lot of thought should be, uh, um, should be taken into, into purchasing a pet, and the parents should really uh, play a role in that. Uh, it's, it's very easy to walk in and spend $20 on an animal and get it home, and, and it's great for a week, but then, like you said, it loses its novelty and, and, and it's neglected. So um, any time that you think about purchasing a pet, just make it a, make it a, a real uh, you know, thought-out decision. What does his back feel like? His back is very spinal. I don't know if we can... Sure. Uh, it's very rough. I want you to know this is very brave. <laughs> I'm being very brave here. Very courageous. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is rough. You can see down here, um, it looks like when he was younger, a part of his tail was broke off. Almost all lizards, as a defense mechanism, can release some of their tail. 
if a bird of prey or an animal was to grab a hold of this and actually pull on it, the lizard could detach its tail and then run away to safety. So. And but it doesn't grow back. It just yes, it does. It, it does grows grow back, back, but it doesn't grow as long and, and as pretty as it would if if it would have been unharmed. So this is a uh, Pakistan leopard gecko. Uh, you can see. Oh yeah, he's beautiful. Very delicate skin. Uh, it's a desert animal again. Um, the geckos there's, uh, have little claws on them. They can climb rocks. Uh, great for sand. It's just a beautiful lizard. I don't know if you can see that. Sure. Very, very a tight pretty. Shot on it, maybe. And of course you call it leopard because it's spotted. Right, they're spotted. When they're juveniles, they actually have a banded uh, a pattern. But as they get bigger, they uh, spot out and they get that nice yellow color. So this is a very healthy, beautiful animal. Thank you. Yeah, these are guinea pigs. Uh -huh. I think everyone's seen them. Sure. And these were raised by one of the ladies that's a livestock manager. <laughs> and they've been handled all their life. They're not cooperating right now, but they're good once they get up. <laughs> you can hear them squeal. But they've been, um, these guys have been raised and handled all their life, and once you get them in your hand, they, they normally calm down. <laughs> this is a great child's pet. Uh, very durable animals. Um, and relatively uh, long-lived for rodents. Um, and they, they take uh, they take care, but they're not uh, a constant need like some of the, some of these other animals. Are. They're great little animals. So this one has long hair. Just mm -hmm. some of them come with shorter hair. Yeah, some of them come with short hair. Some of them come. With, uh, you can pretty. see. Oh yeah, he's beautiful. Very delicate skin. Uh, it's a desert animal again. Um, the geckos there's, uh, have little claws on them. They can climb rocks. Uh, great for sand. It's just a beautiful lizard. I don't know if you can see that. Sure. Very, very tight pretty. Shot on it, maybe. And of course, you call it leopard because it's spotted. Right, they're spotted. When they're juveniles, they actually have a banded uh, a pattern. But as they get bigger, they uh, spot out and they get that nice yellow color. So this is a very healthy, beautiful animal. Yeah, these are guinea pigs. I think everyone's seen them. Sure. And these were raised by one of the ladies that's a livestock manager. <laughs> and they've been handled all their life. They're not cooperating right now, but they're good once they get up. <laughs> you can hear them squeal. But they've been, um, these guys have been raised and handled all their life. And once you get them in your hand, they, they normally calm down. <laughs> This is a great child's pet. Uh, very durable animals um, and relatively long lived for rodents. Um, and they, they take uh, they take care, but they're not uh, a constant need like some of the, some of these other animals. Are. They're great little animals. So this one has long hair. Just mm -hmm. some of them come with shorter hair. Yeah, some of them come with short hair. Some of them come with uh, actually crinkled hair, uh, long hair, short hair. There's all different types mm -hmm. of breeds. So. Would you say that a guinea pig is a, is a good way to start a younger child in terms of caring for a pet before that you take another, a, a bigger step such as a dog or right. something like that? I would say that guinea pigs are, are great uh, beginner's pets. Um, like I said, they're, they're put together, they're little tanks almost, but uh, that doesn't say that they should be handled rough. Right. But uh, for young kids, they're great, they're lovely. Erica, you were on our last show, right? Mm-hmm. And you had your guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. Has Huggles had her babies yet? Nope. We're still waiting. <laughs> still waiting on the birth of the guinea pigs, huh? I don't know. Maybe she's maybe she's just back. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you weren't sure if she was gonna have a baby or not? Maybe the pet store says she's pregnant. Maybe she isn't. How long are you supposed to have to wait? This she sure had them on Monday a long time ago. Okay. Well. <laughs> Sometimes those babies aren't always on schedule, you know? Nah. <laughs> well, gosh, uh, did you guys get all of your questions answered about these exotic pets? Everybody? Anything? They, these are some more, more, more of the unusual pets that uh, you might or might not just kind of have around your house very often, huh? Well, except for the rabbit, maybe. And maybe the, the pygmy hedgehog or something like that. But normally we don't keep tarantulas <laughs> hanging about in the house in a little cage, you know? Okay. We're just about out of time, and uh, I want to.
tell the folks from Super Pets, Matt and Jeff, that we really appreciate your time and for sharing these animals with us. We've had all kinds of animals, from birds to tarantulas, and we've learned so very much about what they eat and the kinds of things they do to protect themselves. Some of these, some of these stories I've never heard. You know, I didn't realize uh, that the, the, the bigger spiders, the tarantulas, actually, you know, kick off little hairs uh, into a cloud of dust to protect themselves. Protect themselves. So we have all learned so very much today, and I thank uh, the audience for being here, and of course the folks at Super Pets, and right now I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie. Well, we're all out of time, and we want to thank our guests for coming. Thank you, Jeff and Matt Allen for bringing in the Super Pets. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Marsha, for being on the show with us. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you all you USA Kisser reporters for your great stories. And you, our audience, for watching. <coughs> Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, kids can make, make a, a difference. difference. Kids are really smart. Kids have really neat ideas, and kids can do a lot. You've been watching USA Kids today. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.